Bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord, please. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful this morning. We are so thankful for your goodness and your kindness. Father, you are the one true living God, the creator and sustainer of all life. And yet, Lord, you take notice of us. You love us. You take care of us. You provide for us, even salvation. Father, we are grateful and thankful for what you have done through your son, Jesus, and what he has done at the cross on our behalf. He did what we could not do, and he saves us by his grace and by the sacrifice that he has made. He paid the penalty in full. He took the sin of the world upon himself, and he died there on that cross, receiving the punishment that we deserve. How can we not love you? Father, I pray this morning as we come to your word in this time that, uh, Father, may our hearts and our minds, may we set things aside that have been worrying and bothering us this week, things that we're going through. And we'd ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word. Speak, O oh Lord, speak to us this morning. And may we, as we hear your word, take it with us and to ponder it and think it through in our hearts and that your spirit will change us from the inside out. And Father, we pray for those who are unable to be here this morning and those who are not feeling well, Father, and those who are traveling, some are not able to get out, and we just ask God, your good hand, to please be upon them, Father, and bless them and protect them. We pray that uh, they'll be able to hear the message this morning through uh, uh, the electronics that we use here. And Father, I just pray that in all things, you would be glorified. You would be lifted up in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to be reading from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then exist, existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which we are now, which are now preserved by the same word, are deserved for fire, reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So we are continuing uh, Peter's, uh, in, in Peter's warning to these people that are susceptible to this false teaching, this false doctrine, Last week, we looked at, uh, just in the you know, end of chapter 2 there, we looked at the reality that false teaching usually uh, comes from a, a wrong heart. In other words, you believe what you most want to believe. When we think of beliefs and, and doctrine and those kind of things, we usually think in terms of it being a, a mind thing, and it is. But Peter actually identifies that it's a heart problem first, a desire for the wrong thing first, and particularly what we learned was that these false teachers were tempting uh, these dear saints to go into a, uh, to, to be, to basically go into an area that they had been freed from, and that's really sin, uh, to tempt them into sin, the very sin that Christ had freed them from. So in a sense, they were being tempted to be enslaved back into the area, into, into something that God said they were free from by the merits of Jesus Christ. And now we come to this passage, and Peter is going to turn, and now he's really going to deal with more of the, of the, 
of the doctrinal problem. He's, this is more of a, if you think last week, of a desire heart problem and the desire heart message. Th this now he's going to talk about the, from a mental intellectual uh, issue. He's going to deal with the, the doctrinal problems and help them to understand what's really going on here. And from this, really, it will help us not to understand just this problem doctrinally, but how we can deal and should deal with doctrinal problems in our world. Because do we not have them? We have them a lot. There are a lot of doctrinal problems in our world and, um, and wrong thinking. And, and I'll identify some of that as we go through this. So yesterday, my, uh, my youngest daughter finished up her soccer season. Uh, we decided to let her play soccer this, this fall. And she had... Uh, this team, the team that she was on, happened to be the, a team that was really, really good. Uh, they were undefeated. I think they tied in one game, but other than that, they were undefeated. They, their last five games were shutouts. And, um, and uh, that's particularly impressive because they have, they have something really f interesting. So when you get up to about five points, they will actually, uh, is it five? Four points, four points. When they get up, when they get up to, when they get over five, four points, um, if the other team hasn't scored a point yet, then they actually take away a player. All right, and then they score another point and they take another player away. And they score another point, they take another player away. They keep taking players away the more points they score. Well, if you think about that, this team was undefeated for five games, and sometimes on the field there were no more than like five players. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of amazing uh, uh, that, uh, that that was happening. It, it was funny yesterday, where the last game they had, they won that game as well. It was a shutout as well. Uh, and, and somebody would score a goal, and then they'd be out. <laughs> that was their reward. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was sort of funny. I mean, that, that's just how good this team was. In the entire season, only eight goals were scored against them for the entire season. Um, and I think it was like in the 30s that they had scored a, uh, against other, other teams. Now, there's a reason for that. And it, 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 in this particular team, they did not just have a good offense. They had a really good defense. They had good goalies. But particularly, there was this one, one guy, one kid. His name was Arnold. And nothing gets by this kid. I mean, seriously, they would have... They would have pretty formidable, the opponent would have pretty formidable offense, and you thought, oh, he's going to give up. And, I mean, nothing got by the guy. Like, he hit, yesterday, it was, like, it was just amazing. They had a really, not just a good offense, which they did, and they developed the offense over time, but they had, from the very beginning, an extremely good defense. And the reason I mention all that, you say, well, why are you talking about soccer? <laughs> it doesn't have to do with anything. What's, what Paul is, or Paul, what Peter is going to do here is he is really going to help us to deal with false error. And he's first going to teach us how to do it defensively. Then he's going to, so that we're on the defense, then he's going to explain the particular problem, the doctrinal problem. And then he's going to go on the offense against these, do, these people. First, there's a, a defense. And, and so, you know, how do we deal with doctrinal error? Well, we deal with it first defensively, then intelligently. We've got to know what the other people believe. And then, finally, offensively. We'll find defensively in verses 1 through 3, intelligently, verse 4, and offensively in verses 5 through 7. So we begin by dealing with doctrinal deviance, doctrinal error, defensively. Dealing with it defensively. And so when we come here, we're going to find... Uh, that it says this, picking up in chapter three, verses one through three. Uh, Beloved, I write now to I, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. So Peter says, I am going to, st I want to stir up your pure minds. What does he mean by that? He's, he said that he was, he did this in the last, uh, this is a, uh, this is his second epistle. And there is some debate as, as to what, what he's talking about as far as the second epistle. 
Some suggest that the first epistle was actually not 1 Peter. Um, it was another epistle that didn't get inscripturated, and that's possible. Paul did that, and there were others that wrote epistles that were not. And, you know, the letters that were written by the apostles to the churches, not all of them ca- uh, were, were included in the New Testament canon. But I think very likely he is referencing his first epistle being 1 Peter and his second epistle being 2 Peter in this particular case. And he says his goal for both epistles is to stir them up. He wants to stir them up. Now the word stir up, uh, you see this in a couple of other places. We, see, we saw this already in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. And again, he's going to say the way that I'm going to stir you up is reminding you. And in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, it's interesting that this word has, it, it's translated asleep. In fact, Christ is in the stern of the boat. It's, a, it's that story, Mark chapter 4, verse 30, 38, and Jesus is asleep when the stor- storm comes, and they need to awaken him. They need to wake him up, and it's in that context that this word is used. Now, there's an implication here that's very important, and that is that spiritually, brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritually, you and I can very easily become spiritually asleep. It's very easy for us to just sort of nod off spiritually. To not, and how does this happen? It happens when we, when we're no longer intentional about the gospel. When we're no no longer purposeful about spiritual growth. When we're just going through our life, sort of in the back of our mind, we know we're Christians, but we're really not engaged in the work of the gospel on a daily basis. We're engaged with doing really our, what we want to do in building up our own kingdom, not the kingdom of God. And if we're not careful, it can, we, it's, it's like we are spiritually asleep. And apparently that was common, so common that in this general epistle that Peter writes to several churches at the same time, he says, it is very important for me to stir you up. And he writes these two epistles for us to be stirred up. He says, your mind, your disposition is pure, it's sincere, but you need to be stirred up. We, in our culture, it's very easy for us to be, to be, spirit, to, to be in spiritual slumber. And we can go entire days without even thinking about the gospel, about how the gospel should be working our lives. We can go entire weeks, perhaps, without really considering how, how I should be applying the gospel today. And if that's happening in our lives, then the Bible would call that spiritual slumber. And Peter is saying, I need to stir you up. And it's interesting, he doesn't stir them up by giving them new truth. He stirs them up, he says, by causing them to remember I mean, the very fact that we are going to do the Lord's Supper later today is a remembrance. It's to stir us up when it comes to understanding and knowing and remembering what Christ did for us. We constantly need to be stirred up. It's it's why we assemble together from week to week. It's why we get together and worship God. It's why we need times of personal devotion. We must constantly be stirred up. And Peter realized that they were stir- he was stirred up. And there are three, there are two purposes in this text, two ways that Peter's going to stir them up. First of all, he says that you may be may uh, remember, you may remember is. You know, you ha- that, you'll, that you may be mindful or remember of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments. He wants them to remember. Well, what does he want them to remember? And this is going to become very important in a few moments. He wants them to remember, he says, the commandments, the, the, the words of the holy po- prophets, that's the Old Testament prophets, and the commandments of us. It's interesting, he says, holy prophets, by the way, to, dis- to, to distinguish them from false prophets, which he had already spoken against. He says, I want you to remember the good prophets, the true prophets, the holy prophets of the Old Testament. And I want you to remember the commandment of the apostles, he said, us, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants, you to, he wants them to remember both of these. Now, what he is talking about here is this. When Jesus Christ came, he came 
And when, Jesus, when he came, he authenticated the, the, what the Old Testament prophets said. He said these, what the Old Testament prophets taught were reliable. In other words, some people qu- say, well, how do you get the Bible? How do, you, how does the, how do we know what's, what's really in the Bible and what's true? Well, generally speaking, we know because of what Jesus said. He came to us bodily. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, the Word, incarnate God, came, and he said, follow the law and the prophets. In Luke 24, 44, for example, and there are several times in the New Testament it says this, but he said, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and the prophets and the psalms concerning me that's the old testament jesus verifies the old testament he says the old testament word is true how do we know the words of god are true because jesus said they were in the old testament the 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 incarnate christ came and said these things are true they will be fulfilled but jesus also told the apostles when he was with them that you are going to give new truth. You are, the Spirit of God is going to come to you and he is going to work in your life and in your what life and such that new truth will come. And that's how we get the New Testament. In John chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go not away, the helper will not come unto you. But if I depart, he will send, I will send unto you. And when he has come, he will convict the word of tr- sin, of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not, and of righteousness because of, I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the rule of the world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, he says, I've got more to say, you can't bear it now. When he, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you, apostles, into all truth, for he will speak on my, on his, he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take uh, what, uh, what is mine and declare it to you. So what Peter is saying, he wanted to remind them that the word of God came by the Old Testament prophets, by Jesus Christ himself as the incarnate word, and by the New Testament apostles. That's how we get our word. He was, he was signaling to them, remember how reliable this is. It's extremely reliable. And that's going to become very important in a few moments as we look at, these, at what's going on with these people. Now, I just want to say this, and I could, I could talk a lot about this, but I, do, I just want to say it this way. Do you realize how incredible the divine design of this book is? This, we, we talked about in Sunday school how it really produces faith, and there's a reason for that. When you read through this book, you see that it is divinely inspired And it is verified and cross-verified is self-authenticating in such a way that if you will if you will make this book your necessary food it's going to increase your faith and strengthen your faith if you really see this as vital that you're living and breathing it then it will strengthen your faith in such a way that when you look at circumstances of life and when you look at creation and when you look when you look of all at all of that your faith will remain strong you're going to see why that's so important in a few moments, but let's then turn to purpose number two, awareness of the reality of false doctrine. He says, look, you've got to remember how reliable this is, number one. What's a good defense? A good defense for false doctrine is just remember, remember how reliable this thing is. But number two, be aware, be on guard for false doctrine. It's, it's, it's around. And he actually says this, he says, knowing this first, that scoffers, and scoff, by scoffers he means mockers, deceivers, those who will deceive you, they are here for the last days. They are here in the last days. Now, when we see the word last days in the New Testament, I do need to remind us of something. Uh, and I need to remind us because we have heard preaching on this, and, it, and it's been wrong in the past. Not, hopefully not from this pulpit, but I mean, I mean in the past in other places, perhaps. Have you ever heard a preacher say, you know, I just know we're living in the last days. Have you ever heard that? Sorry for you from the South. I don't mean to, I don't mean to speak, in, you know, but anyway, 
I'm, 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 I, have, I have lineage from the South as well, so anyway. My, my, my mother was, was, um, was born in Slidell, Louisiana, so I, you know, I feel somewhat comfortable speaking Southern. No, but really, really, have you heard somebody say that? Well, they're right, but that's not what they mean. Because the last days started with the first advent of Christ and ends with the second advent of Christ. We are in the last days, but so were they in the first century. The last days has lasted over 2,000 years and may last longer. So understand, when the word, when Scripture talks about two, uh, and, and you could verify that, in fact, the Old Testament talks about the last days. We won't take the time to look at those. It's, it's all over the New Testament uh, that talks about the last days. But in Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus said to them, He that no, man, no one deceives you, and then later on in verse 24, uh, verse 11 of 24, it says, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And it, it's talking about the last days, which start, when Christ, when, which start with the first advent of Christ and end when Christ comes back. We are in the last days, but we've been in the last days for the last 2,000 years. Now, what it says is that Peter, uh, Christ rather is warning the, the disciples that you, the, in the last days, you're going to have false teaching. You're going to have false prophets. Peter's warning them, you're going to have false teaching. You're going to have false prophets. And folks, we ought to be warned as well. We're going to have false teaching. We're going to have false prophets in the last days. And the way that we keep from going into spiritual slumber, frankly, is that not only do we rely on, uh, uh, that we just, we, we imbibe this. And we realize how reliable it is, and we just learn it, and know it, and grow in it, and understand it, and, and increase in it. We not only do that, but we, aware, we are aware that there is an enemy. And we are aware that there is false doctrine that comes from our culture, just like it did in the first century, that teaches us wrong things. Now, those are the ways that we, that we keep from going into spiritual slumber. Peter is saying, he's implying that those who are in spiritual slumber, who aren't vigilant, who aren't constantly knowing the word and constantly knowing the gospel and living out the gospel, who aren't aware of the wrong thinking and wrong influences of, of the world, if they're not vigilant, they are slumbering and they're susceptible to deception. And you and I need to be very careful that we aren't in that state, that we are, we are in with, that we aren't susceptible to being deceived. Now, with that in mind, what was this particular error? And we come to verse 4 here, and Peter's going to tell us. He says this, and saying, where is, the coming of his, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. And what is he talking about? First of all, they're asking the question. They're putting doubts. And here's the doubt. Is he really coming? Is Christ really coming again? Now it's interesting that Christ was just there not that many years before, okay? Hadn't been that long since he'd been there. And they're already asking, is he really coming again? We're 2,000 years down the road and people are asking the same question, is he really coming? I mean, is Christ really gonna come? Back then, they were asking that question, is Christ really coming? Now, I want us to be very clear about something. I won't take the time to t show you, but it doesn't take long to look. In the Old Testament, the coming of Christ is all over the place. It is constant. And in the New Testament, nearly every book in the New Testament speaks of the coming of Christ. There, is, there are very few doctrines in all of, the, all of scriptures that are more repeated than the coming of Christ. So the Bible declares that he is coming, and they're questioning it. Now, do you think of somebody else that questioned the word of God? There's the very first serpent that came to Adam and Eve and said, hath God said? And that's exactly what you have these people doing. Is God, is Christ really coming back? Is he really coming? Now, they had an argument. They had an argument for why they believe that Christ was no longer coming back. It's in that second part of verse 4. It says, for since fathers fell asleep, the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, the fathers were probably talking about, um, uh, talking about the Old Testament uh, saints, 
Uh, it's likely what they were referring to. And of course, fell asleep is a euphemism for dying. They're, so these, since they've died, okay, and they gave their prophecies, uh, they said all things have continued. They haven't been fulfilled. All things have continued as they were. They're, they're questioning scripture. They're questioning these things. And, they're, and here's, their, here's their argument. They're saying, yes, we believe that God created everything. Yes, we believe in the creation. But they're saying creation, as God set it up, has, had, has continued. And here's what they're saying. They're, it's continued without intervention from God. And here's how they, here's how they put it. They, they would say something like, have you, you've heard of miracles, but have you seen miracles? You've heard of God's intervention, but have you really seen it? I mean, have you, have you, have you really seen it in the world? Now, let's pause and just think about that for a minute. People say, well, I believe in miracles, but you know, there's a lot of things that aren't really actually miracles. They're workings of God probably, but you could probably explain it some other way. Have you ever thought about that? Somebody says, well, I know God did this. I know the Lord did this in my life. And I would never question when somebody says that, but many people would. And somebody would say, somebody would say, well, pff, you th you're saying God said that, but that was a cause and effect. Here's the cause. There's the effect. You need to look at the cause a little bit more. And there's another cause besides God did this. This was just a natural out. This is a natural result of the creative of, of creation taking its form. This is this is just, you know, as luck would have it or this is, you know, those kinds of things. And you don't try to attribute everything to divine intent. I mean, come on now. Have you ever had those kind of thoughts yourself? Have you ever thought somebody's like, you know, they, they say they, they see God in everything. I'm just not seeing it. And so what these, the argument that these people were making and the doubts that they were putting in people's mind is they were basically saying, look, I can explain everything by rational, by rational explanation of creation so that, so that God doesn't really intervene. All things are really just a natural flow from, from creation. Yes, God created everything, but everything's a natural flow from that. They actually affirmed the creation of by God, but they said God does not intervene. That was the false doctrine. Now, let me just mention this. It is true that what God said was that creation was what? It was good and very good. So God often does work within creation to fulfill his purposes. He does do that. But to say that God doesn't intervene or to say that God, God has taken his hands off of creation and does what is, is by definition false doctrine. And that's actually what Peter is dealing with in this passage. Now, there are, there are three implications I want us to understand in really thoroughly understanding what this false doctrine is. Number one, it is, a, it is a, an argument against divine intervention. God is not divinely intervening in the world. Number two, they're saying that creation has continuity. There is a continuity in creation that's not interrupted by God. And they're saying this because we can't observe. We, we're not observing any interruptions. So implication number three, what are they saying? They're actually saying they're putting the authority, they're, they're making a priority their observation of creation over what the word of God says. And folks, that is the danger point. When you make an observation, when you observe circumstances and s observe creation and you say, my observations are, are of higher authority or even of equal authority, frankly, but of certainly of higher authority to the authority of the word of God. When you make that decision, that determination, you, that is the gateway for false doctrine. You will begin to see, you will begin to see the word of God through the lens of your observation of creation rather than seeing the, your observation of creation through the lens of the word of God. And you will have all kinds of, of false doctrine thinking and false doctrine that will come from that. Now, let me just make this point that actually when you observe creation uh, accurately, 
there are not contradictions usually with the Word of God. Usually they work together. Usually when you're objectively observing creation and you're objectively looking at word, word, the Word of God, there is not a lot of contradiction. But there is sometimes. And when there is, we as Christians have to make a decision. Which one are we going to go with? And we have to let the Word of God be the authority. And we have to understand that various perspectives are going to have, have there's, there's different presuppositions, there's different perspectives to look at, and the truth of the matter is, it really is a matter of what lens you're looking through. And it's interesting as you go through throughout history, church history, uh, and, you, and you go throughout just actually history in general, oftentimes science ends up catching up with what the Bible has already said. Now, all of that's important to understand this, that when you want to detect false doctrine or when, when you are susceptible to false doctrine, you are basically saying, my circumstances or the creation I'm observing, I don't see how it's consistent with Scripture, and now I am stepping over and saying, okay, that's more important to me. And as soon as you make that determination, you are going to end up in false doctrine, very likely going to end up in false doctrine. Now, did you know that this is this is actually this was actually the belief of many of our founding fathers back in that time it was called deism and actually i looked it up because i didn't know if it's still a thing today but and it is there are there are a good number of modern deists today deism according to one particular bible dictionary lexham bible dictionary says this it is a philosophical belief that posits that God is, exists as an uncaused first cause, ultimately responsible for creation of the universe, but does not interfere directly with the created world. Uh, equivalently, deism can also be defined as a view that posits that God's existence and cause of all things and admits its perfection, but rejects divine revelation or direct intervention of God in the universe by miracles. It also, according to this source, rejects a source of religious knowledge and assertions. Uh, it rejects it from revelation, the Bible, and it only comes through the natural world, uh, through observation of the natural world, and it is sufficient to determine the existence of a single creator or absolute principle of the universe. Now, that, are, that is basically the tenets of deism. In other words, deism says... That, that yes, you can, you can, through rational observation, you can look at the world and know there's a creator. And by the way, the Bible says that, Romans chapter 1. But what it says is, with no intervention by God, okay, there's not intervention. In other words, it's like a, a top, you spin the top and you let it go, all right? And that's what God did in creation. He spun the top and he let it go and he doesn't interfere, interfere. And he says, and you cannot determine who God is by any revelation of God. And it would then mean the word of God as well. So then in the first century, or not first century, in the, in the beginning of our country, you had many people that believed in varying forms of this kind of doctrine. You had people like Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist. He was very, very clear deist. He was probably the clearest of all of them. In fact, what he believed about the Bible that was that it was a good moral book with good principles, but there were a lot of things that were absolutely in contradiction to his observation, and he created his own Bible. He cut out a bunch of stuff and created his own Bible. That's Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you have uh, uh, Thomas Paine, who wrote a book called The Age of Reason, who was also a deist, who believed something similar. In the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, he said as well that he was a deist. He said he came to his, his understanding of deism by actually hearing preaching that argued against deism, but the arguments were so, so uncompelling that it actually convinced him to be a deist. But what's interesting, I'll just say this about Franklin. I don't think, from what I can tell, Franklin ever came to Christ, but it's interesting that toward... The, toward the end of his life, he did say this. He said, um, the, deity, uh, the deity sometimes interferes by his particular prof providence, sets aside the events which would otherwise be 
uh, have been produced in, a, in the course of nature or by free agency of man. Uh, he said, the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs the affairs of man. So toward the end of his life, he began to say, you know, look, he, the longer I live, the more I experience life, the more I'm ob rationally observing life. Oh, actually, God does govern in the affairs of man. He was still a deist. He didn't, he, I don't think he was ever converted to Christianity, but, but he was. Now, there were others that, that were very likely Christians. You have uh, John Adams that probably was, and uh, uh, others as well. But, but this is, this is the, so, so let me ask you this question. Is there deism today? And there absolutely is. There is deism today. If there's not formal deism, there's functional deism. How many people in the world would say, would not deny that Christ, that, or that there is a creator God, and it's fine for funerals, and it might be okay for weddings, and it's okay for certain circumstances, but in my everyday life, God's not involved. How many people are like that? What you basically have there is functional deism. You basically are, you know, it's the question of whether God really intervenes. Now, I am, uh, I, I'm not as far as I want, but we're going we're gonna to keep going here. Um, let me then move here to how does Peter deal with this? This is really going to be helpful for us. How does Peter deal with doctrinal deviance? He's going to go on the offense now in verses 5 through 7. Look at what he says here. He says, For this they, that's talking about the false teachers, willingly forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire under the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay, what is that talking about there? He says, first of all, these folks, these false teachers are willingly forgetting a few things. In other words, and he says willingly because he says it really, it really, they don't want to remember some things that are absolutely necessary to remember. He points to their will, their heart as the problem. He sort of reminds us of that again. And he says this, they're forgetting, or let, let's put it this way, they're dismissing certain truths. And there are two events that he's going to point to that, that he says they're really dismissing the details of those two events. Creation and the flood. He says those are the two events that they're actually dismissing, both creation and the flood. So note, uh, and so that's important. We're going to see that in a minute. But one other preliminary thing, what you're going to see here is he is going to say it is by the word of God that these things happen, both the creation of the world and the flood. The agent, God's agent, the agent by which these come about is the very word of God. That's why you actually find in Genesis chapter one, when the creation comes, it says God said nine times, okay? Nine times you have God said, God said, God said, and God said, and God said throughout. The, why? Why is that important? Because it was from the word of God that creation came. That's going to actually be important. In Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, it's talking about Jesus, and we already noted that Jesus is the Word incarnate, and it says about him, He is before all things, and in, in him all things consist. And in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Who being in the brightness of the glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding the thi all things by the word of his power, talking about Jesus. It was by the word of the power of Jesus that things came to being. It is the word that it created, and it is the word by which the flood comes as well, and frankly, the word by which redemption comes as well. It's all, it's all based on the word. Now, then he says this. There are three arguments that he gives arguments for refuting this particular false doctrine. Number one, he speaks to, uh, of the argument of creation. The argument of creation. Now, notice what he says in the passage, picking up in verse 5 of chapter 3, it says, for this they willingly, willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old 
and the earth standing out of water and in the water. What's it talking about? Well, would you take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 1, and we just for a few minutes want to look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Genesis chapter 1, by the word of God, and it has this standing in the water and out of the water. What is this talking about? Look at Genesis chapter 1 for a moment. It says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay, let's just pause there. God creates in the beginning this, the heaven and the earth, and it says it's without form and void, and darkness is upon the face of the deep. And then he intervenes in his own creation. Look at the next verse. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. That's the intervention of God in his initial creation. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called his light day, and the darkness he called night for the evening and the morning of the first day. Then God said, verse 6, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven so that the evening and the morning were the second day. What is God doing? God is taking his initial creation of the heaven and the earth, and now he's intervening. And he's taking the land, the earth, and he is creating an earth and separating the waters from the waters by the land. And he actually, we're going to learn later, as he's using the waters for his creative purposes, he's actually intervening in the midst of his creation. And God, and, and Peter's saying to them, hey, hey, have you like forgotten people, these false teachers, that even in creation, God is intervening? In his own creation argument number one but if that's not a good not good enough now he's going to move, move to argument number two from the flood now just on its face when you mention the flood and what happened in the flood talking about noah's ark and the flood that you know flooded the whole earth just on its face you see god's intervention do you not how can you affirm the flood and deny the intervention of god that's not possible just on its face it doesn't make any sense but notice what the argument that he makes here. He says this, and we won't take the time to turn there, but you, if you went to Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, you'll note that prior to the flood, of course, that everyone's sinful. In fact, the, the, we've already discussed this before, but, but the whole world is in an extremely sinful state, probably more than ever before prior to that time. And he, he's going to deal with them. And he's going to deal with them by judgment, actually. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, interestingly enough, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the seventh month, the seventh day of the month, on the day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And you have this judgment by water. Now, he's going to make this, he's going to make this point. Remember we said before, that these false teachers were saying there was continuity in creation, that God created the world, and basically there was this continuity in creation that isn't interrupted or changed. It just keeps going, and there's no intervention of God. Well, he's going to point out, Peter's going to say, well, wait a minute. Did you know that the water in Genesis 1 is used for creative purposes, and the water in Genesis 6, 7 and 8 and 9, that passage, just 6, 7 and 8, did you know the water is used for destructive purposes? God uses the water to create the world, and God uses the water to destroy and to kill and for judgment. That doesn't sound like a lot of continuity, does it? Why? Because God is going to use creation however he chooses by his intervention. That's his point. And that's argu argument number two. The flood, uh, the flood itself is a demonstration of God's intervention and shows that God will take the same creation that he's used for one purpose and he will use it for another purpose according to his will. And we see that in the word of God ex uh, explained. And then he says, argument number three, okay, so 
Argument number three is this, for future judgment. He says, okay, so this really boils down to what their point is. They're saying, is Christ really coming? Is there really going to be a future judgment? Is Christ going to really, is there going to be a reckoning? Is that really going to happen? And God says, well, the word of God has already brought forth other things. By the word of God, creation occurred. By the word of God, flood occur, the flood occurred. By the word of God, we could also say that Christ came. By the word of God, all of these other things came, and we have clarity about the coming of Christ by the word of God. Why on earth would we not believe that God is going to fulfill his promises of the coming of Christ when he's already so clearly fulfilled his promises of what he has already promised in creation and in the flood and in other things? And by the way, that is one of the most strengthening, 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 faith strengthening concepts is you see the Old Testament prophecies fulfilled, literally fulfilled in amazing ways hundreds of years after they're prophesied. This is a book that's incredible that we can believe, that we could trust, that we could put our faith in, that we could depend upon. It's by the word of God that all of these things occur. So we have no reason to believe anything different than what God says, that the judgment of Christ will come. Now, I want to make this application with all these, and that is this. How could Peter come up with all of these arguments? Well, you say, well, he's an apostle, you know, he's probably a pretty smart guy. He was a fisherman. I'm not saying he's not smart, and I'm not saying fishermen aren't smart, but, but, but he wasn't like this, he wasn't Paul where he was highly educated, you know, uh, uh, formal education, that kind of thing. But I'll tell you this, Peter, knew, Peter obviously knew the word. He obviously was studying the word and knowing the word, and you see that from his sermons in the book of Acts. He really knew God's word. We can really make that and then Peter had the discernment to be able to take the statements from Scripture and take the statements of false teaching and put the false teaching statements through the grid of Scripture and come out and show the error. Can you do that? Can I do that? Can we, do we know the Word of God so well that we can see what's going on in the world, we can see the teaching of the world, and we put it and we sift it through the, the truth of Scripture, and we can identify what's good and what's error. Are we able to do that? In Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 11, the apostles Paul, or Paul the apostle, and also Silas, came to a particular people, and they were particularly impressed with these people for this reason. It says in verse 11 um, that these people were from Berea, and when they came to them, they said these, these were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things be so. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Did you know that the pastor is not the pillar and ground of the truth? The elders are not the pillar and ground of the truth. The deacons are not the pillar and ground of the tr truth. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. We are all responsible for knowing the truth and discerning the truth. And that means, folks, we've got to be in the Word. We've got to be aware and attentive to the thinking of this culture. We've got to be vigilant and awake spiritually in order to be able to do that like Peter was. Now, with that in mind, we need to rack this up, and we're going to ask three questions. Number one, what is a good defense against doctrinal error? What is a good defense? Don't fall asleep spiritually. That's a good defense. Don't fall asleep. Constantly remind yourselves of the truth of the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need it day in and day out and live it out and think about it and, and absorb it and saturate your minds with it. We need to do this. And number two, our defense is being ready, <laughs> being aware that there are many influences out there, all coming from the world and Satan and our flesh, that want to deceive us and, 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 and want us to go the wrong direction. We're still on question one. 
But now we're on question, and then trust the revealed word of God. Trust what God's word says. Know it and trust it. Number two, how do we detect false teaching? How do we detect it? We be alert to those who question and doubt clear, repeated statements of Scripture. When somebody says, did God really say that? And it's repeated in Scripture, it's established in Scripture, it's firm in Scripture, it's not, it's not something that's alluded to or there's some sort of implication, but it is clearly stated in Scripture and somebody says something different, then we need to be alert to it, we need to be aware of it, and we need to identify it as false teaching. Number three, how do we refute doctrinal error offensively? We've got to know the Word. We've got to compare scriptural statements to the word and we need to learn to identify differences in the word we've got to know this word folks that really would be the main point you, you and and be aware that there are as much teaching from the culture that's going to be against what the word of god says and be vigilant when it comes to these things let's pray together father we come to you and praise you and thank you for for your word we thank you that it is our rock with which we can we can um, we can build our house. Uh, it's not as sinking sand uh, where, whereby we are swept up by false teaching. Lord, may we, may we build our, our lives on the rock of the truth of the word of God so that when, when winds come, and certainly they come, when things in life and circumstances in our world and all these things are confusing, that we, we, we find ourselves firmly planted in the truth of the word. Lord, may you remind us of this and teach us this, and may we, may we just know your word more and more. Father, we come to you as well, and we thank you for the time that we can spend together for a few moments, and we can partake of the Lord's Supper together. And we can, we can join in together, uh, Lord, affirming what we know to be true, that Jesus is uh, crucified, uh, buried, risen again, and coming again. Lord, we thank you for what Christ did for us on the cross and shedding his blood and breaking his body for us so that we could have our sins forgiven. He, he died in our place. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as we come today and we affirm that together in unity and bring to remembrance those truths. I pray, Lord, that we would do so in a way that pleases you and uh, is worshipful to you. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hello, my name is Jim Ganam, Senior Pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for streaming our service. We hope and pray that it was truly a blessing to you. You know, we live in a day where we have access to the preaching of God's Word with just a phone or a tablet or with a couple of clicks on our computer. But we really would love to meet you in person. You know, there is just nothing that really replaces the experience of being in a loving community. Here at BBC, you'll be greeted by people who genuinely want to help you to have the best experience you can possibly have. If you have a family, we can help your kids find their fun, interactive classes, and your littlest ones can get settled into our safe, fun, and well-equipped nursery. Then help yourself to a cup of coffee and join us for the main service for singing, praying, and the preaching of God's Word. Although we'd love to have you visit our church, this is not our greatest concern for you. Our greatest concern is that you know how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to let you know about a resource that will help you with this. It is called The Exchange. The Exchange is an easy to use four week guide that helps people to learn how they can have a relationship with God according to the Bible. If you contact us, we'd love to give you a copy while supplies last and we'd also love to meet with you either in person or over the phone or over a FaceTime or Zoom video call so we can walk you through this helpful resource. If you're interested in going through the Exchange Bible Study with us, or if you just have a need we can pray for, please call us at 410-768-4273 or email us at info at bbcofmd.org. 
May the Lord richly bless you. We hope to see you soon.